Well, I am inviting you to the book of Acts, chapter 17, for one verse this morning. Let me remind us all that uh, I am beginning to preach through the Bible. I will be taking one Sunday per book, uh, and I will begin with Genesis next week, the book of Genesis next week. I have done two weeks of what I call motivation, motivating you to love your Bible and get in it. This morning, I want to do a panorama of the whole Bible, just a quick verbal walkthrough of the whole Bible. Then beginning next week, we will take a book a Sunday. And uh, I hope that you will enjoy that. I hope that will, first of all, be, be a, a learning experience, but one that will help you grow spiritually and get you to understand what God is doing. The verse I want to begin with this morning, I, th I, I know you're going to think it's a strange one, but I, as I move along, you, you'll get the drift. One of the churches uh, that was founded under Paul's ministry is the church of Berea. And the Lord paid that church a compliment in Acts 17, verse number 11. <clears throat> and these believers were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They did something the church at Thessalonica wasn't doing very good about. And we'll see in a second here what they were more noble about in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Now, let me stop there and make this observation. So far, the Lord, uh, the Apostle Paul, said the same thing about the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. But here's where it changes. And search the scriptures daily. I made mention of the fact last week that uh, you eat every day, once, twice, three times. If you're uh, on some diets, they make it five times a day. Amazing. And then there are those of us who only eat once a day, every day, all day long. <laughs> they search the scriptures daily. That you, you, you take care of your body every day, take care of your spirit every day. Whether those things were so. Now, the gist of the verse is this. We hear a lot on the radio, on the television, magazines, the internet, a cell phone. You, I, I mean, you hear religious talk. You hear Bible teaching and preaching everywhere. And apparently, there was some of that going on then. But apparently there were a lot of people then who never went to their Bible to check it out. Is this true? And that's where the church at Berea was different. When they heard something, they got in the Word and checked it out to see if that was actually so. Now, uh, uh, let me make a, a casual observation of what I have learned through the years in pastoring churches. I'm always amazed at church members, sheep, lovable sheep, but sometimes I'm amazed at the gullibility of church members. They hear something and they just accept it as truth. They never go to the Bible. And you say, how can you make that kind of an assessment 
Well, because I'm always hearing church members making statements about the Bible or church or Christianity or the second coming or other things that just didn't so. Did you know when you go home today, you're supposed to check me out? You're supposed to get me a Bible later in the day and find out, now did what he said this morning, is that really so? And, and I don't want you to raise your hand, no, I don't want you to smile or grin or frown or wink or anything, but uh, do, you, do you get in your Bible every day and check things out? You're supposed to. You are responsible under God to study and know truth. Now, we teach, we, we help here. And by the way, if all you're getting is about an hour and a half, which, which is Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, and, and, and less than half the congregation comes back for Sunday afternoon and Wednesday night, and less than half the congregation is here for Sunday school, that means some of you are only getting about a, a, a half hour, and if you make every service, you might be getting two hours. Folks, that's not enough. Now, I know that a lot of you, some of you, you're going to go somewhere when this is over and eat, and a whole bunch of you that gets around a big table with Jake and Dorothy's, and that's great. Let me ask you a question. Is that going to be your only meal till next Sunday afternoon? Oh, boy, he's a meddler in this moment. <laughs> well, then why do you do God that way? I took the, I told somebody this morning, I took the Tarleton, the, the, the the, the football team uh, to lunch yesterday right down here at the Paradigm. And I got to think I was superhuman being bodies. I got to thinking, man, if I had a half of them for bodyguards, I wonder how bold I would be in my preaching. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? I got the Lord. I don't need them. I got the Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on. Yes. Let's, let's do this, folks. What a privilege. What a blessing to have a Bible and to get to read it and study it. Now, uh, there are 39 Old Testament books. You knew that. There are 27 uh, Old Testament books. There are 27 New Testament books. You knew that. That makes 66 books. But did you know there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible? Anybody knew that? Ah. How about this? There are 31,173 verses in the Bible. Anybody knew that? Well, I want to really impress you, and no, I didn't count them, but there are 757,444 words in the Bible. Well, I was really expecting at least one. Wow! One? Wow, anybody? Thank you, Dallas. Man. What a blessing, God. Yeah, don't you just love this book that you're holding in your right hand? Oh, yeah, I'll tell you. One day, Philip was in Samaria preaching a great revival. And the Holy Spirit said, Come here, and we'll send you out in the desert. And he took him away from the citywide revival and sent him out there to one man. Now, we would never do that. We would go from one big place to another big place, or from a small place to a bigger place. God doesn't operate like that. By the way, I, I have a number of pastor friends who, in, in, in days gone by, pastored big churches. They are so happy with the little church so they can't understand it. Because the bigger 
The more people, the more problems. When I was at Lake Ridge Baptist Church in Lubbock, Texas, a number of years ago, over 700 members, my office door was a swinging door of problems. We had eight full-time on the church staff. We have 31 full-time in the daycare center. The staff was bigger than this whole church. When I left there, I said, never again. Lord broke me from always wanting bigger and better. So Philip leaves the citywide revival and goes out in the desert and, and meets one man and he hears him reading Isaiah and he says, what are you reading? And he said, do you understand what you're reading? And uh, the Ethiopian eunuch who was uh, the treasurer of the country of Ethiopia said, I, I don't and how can I if somebody doesn't teach me? So that's our time together here. And he invited Philip up into the chariot by the way, let me tell you the rest of the story. Because you know Philip explained, and he got saved, and he went back to Ethiopia, and while Ethiopia today is a barren, starving, horrible place, in Paul's day it was a fertile, green, wonderful place. And while for a while Philip was taken away from a citywide revival, and he went, was obedient to go to one man, that man went home and there was a countrywide revival. Point being, when God calls you, just go. Just go. If God calls you to go minister to one, he knows what he's doing. If God sends us to a church of ten people, God knows what he's doing. Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, you get the word, you study, you stay there, because in doing this, you will both save yourself and them that hear thee. You feed the sheep. Christ said to the apostles, and to us, he said, uh, uh, there are three verses I want to read for you, out of John chapter number 14. First of all, verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loveth me. The acid test for Christianity is not how much you give. It is not how often you go, though you should when you can. It is not how pretty you sing. The acid test from the Lord for a believer is do you love and obey His word? By the way, if we can get Christians to do that, everything else will fall in place. All this other stuff that we foam about and fume about and, 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 and get all worked up about, all that would all work out if folks would just love the Word, stay in it, and obey it. He that loveth me shall be loved in my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he'll keep my words. Don't tell people you love them. Wives, don't tell your husbands you love them if, if you don't please them. And vice versa. And kids, don't tell mom and dad you love them and then you disobey them. The proof of love is obedience. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Verse 26, but the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, uh, whom the Father will send in my he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to remembrance, what I have said unto you. Now we know the Bible is divided in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is a record of the flow of history. It begins with the creation of the universe, the fall of man, the judgment flood over the whole earth. Yes, it was a worldwide flood. The history of Abraham and his son Isaac and his son Jacob, who also became Israel, the fathers of the chosen nation of Israel. It is then the history of Israel 
First of all, they're exiled in Egypt for 430 years. Then there are 40 years of wandering, the exodus and the wilderness. Then a seven year period of the conquest of Canaan. Then a 350 year period of the era of the judges. Followed by a united kingdom by first Saul, then David, and then Solomon covering a period of 110 years. Then the kingdom divided under the son of Solomon. And Judah was the southern kingdom and Israel was the northern kingdom, the larger one that lasted about 350 years. And because of that whole period of continual spiritual decline that was followed by a 70 year Babylonian captivity. And that was then followed by a 140 year period of returning and rebuilding of the land which was then followed by a 400 year period of silence when there was no word from the Lord. The details and the history of this period all that I've just gone through is what the 39 books of the Old Testament are all about. And they are divided into five specific categories. First of all, it's just called the law or the books of Moses or the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth book of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, and Deuteronomy. That is followed by the historical section of the Old Testament, Joshua through Esther. That's followed by what is called five wisdom books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. That is followed by major prophets, the preaching books of the Old Testament. They're called major because they're big books. Isaiah through Daniel. And then the closing out of the Old Testament, minor prophets because they were small books, not because their message was any less important. As a matter of fact, as the period, the preaching period, the prophets, the spokesmen of God, as the history of Israel progressed, the smaller books had much sterner and severe and threatening messages than the big books. And that closes out with Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. There, from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, all the way to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, Christ was foretold in many varied ways. The truth of the matter is, all through the Old Testament, you have the history of two people. You have the history of the nation of Israel physically, but much more, in, in infinitely much more. You have the history of spiritual Israel, God calling out a people for his name. And when we get into the New Testament, because Israel finally rejected their final straw in their spiritual history was their rejection of Christ. And then God put Israel on the back burner where they've been now for 2,000 years. I'm not saying there aren't Jews being saved because there are, but God's national long-range program for Israel is now on hold. And a wild olive branch, God called them, that's us Gentiles, were grafted in, and now is the time of the Gentiles that appeared in the New Testament, which we are in, where we are being saved. 
So we come to the New Testament and it begins with John the Baptist. John the Baptist closed the period of the Old Testament. Last prophet. And the New Testament goes to another John. John the Apostle who wrote the book of the Revelation very late in his life, 90, 95 years old. We have first the four Gospels, which are the birth, life, death, burial, resur and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the story of Christ doesn't stop there. Through the churches, through the apostles, through Paul, through the epistles, we are taught of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospels are Christ's birth and life, revelation, the eternality of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we come to the book of Acts, which is the history of the beginning church, the history of the early church. That is followed by the book of Romans, which we are now studying and by the end of the year, we'll consummate the teachings, the doctrines, the magna charta of the Christian church, followed by the letters of the Apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, to the churches, his letters from 1 Corinthians all the way to the book of Titus. Then we have the book of Hebrews. There is much discussion who wrote the book of Hebrews? Personally, there's no question in my mind, it was Paul. If you don't agree with that, it doesn't matter. Because who ultimately wrote the book of Hebrews was God, the Holy Spirit, by divine inspiration. And then we have the epistles. Letters to individuals, to pastors, to persecuted and scattered believers, followed by the last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation. What happened 6,000 years ago, God stopped eternity and established time. And now, man has been living for 6,000 years under time. And at a certain point in the book of, late in the book of Revelation, God will stop time and revert back to eternity. And by that time, every man, woman, boy, and girl that's ever lived on the planet will either be in a hell for rejecting Christ or in the Lord's heaven for receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. You see, the Bible ultimately is God's redemptive purpose and program and plan unfolded in the Scriptures. If you really wanted to outline the whole Bible broadly, it would be this way. Five divisions. Number one, the revelation of the character of God God's self-revelation. The only place you can ever really know about God is in his book that he wrote about himself to us. Number two, it is the revelation of divine judgment for disobedience. The only place you're going to find what God's going to do with Christ rejectors is in the Bible. Thirdly, is the revelation of divine blessing for obedience. You want to know about God's heaven? For those who are saved, go to the word of God. Number four, it is the revelation of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice on the cross for sin. Man will offer you another Bible, another Savior, another way to heaven. The Bible is the only place you're going to find the truth about sin. You're going to find the truth about the consequence of sin. You're going to find the truth 
about how to get saved. You're going to find the truth about those that reject. You're going to find the truth about heaven. And number five, the Bible is the only revelation of the kingdom and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and your eternal future in Christ. Basically, those five things outline the whole Bible. From Genesis to Revelation. When God began in Genesis, He will end in Revelation. Well, why study the Bible? Because it's the source of truth. The ultimate and only source of truth. Because it's the source of God's blessing on your life when you obey. Because it is the source of victorious Christian living. Because it is the source, source of spiritual growth. It is the source of spiritual power. It is the place, the source, the place where you will find guidance through life. What is your responsibility to the Bible? Well, it is to believe it. It is to honor it. It is to love it. It is to obey it. It is to guard it. It is to fight for it. It is to preach it. In other words, witness. It is to study it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the believer may be perfect, mature, furnished unto all good works. Let me ask you. The question is asked, who can study the Bible? Well, let me answer that question by asking some questions. Number one. Are you saved? Are you a born again child of God? Blood washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Then you must study your Bible. And second question. Are you hungering for the word of God? As long as your physical body is alive and healthy, you're going to get hungry. Did you know when you get sick, first thing goes is your appetite? If you're a Christian and you're not hungry for the Word of God, you've got a problem. There's something wrong. A believer hungers for the Word of God. Are you hungry for the Word of God? Third question. Are you searching God's Word with diligence? My text. They searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. You know, people go on vacation. And, and, and they go to the travel agency or they get on the computer and they, they look up. Oh, they, they want to know everything about where they're going. They want to see pictures. They want to see their motel room. They want to see the beach. Now, one of these days, you're going to take a vacation one way to heaven, and you're going to be there forever. Aren't you a little curious to look up what it's like? Amen. Anybody? Are you searching God's word? Are you seeking holiness? <clears throat> what do you want to be like? You want to be like the world? Or you want to be like God? Are you spirit-filled? I mean, is the work of the Spirit alive and well in you to guide you in the study of the Word of God? In 1576, the first Bible printed in Scotland. It's in a museum in England. 
in the Bible Museum in London. There, in that first Bible, was found written this. Here is the spring where waters flow to quench our heat of sin. Here is the tree where tr truth doth grow to lead our lives therein. Here is the judge that stints the strife when men's devices fail. Here is the bread that feeds the life that death cannot assail. The tidings of salvation, dear, comes to our ears from hence. The fortress of our faith is here and shield of our defense. Then be not like the swine that hath a pearl at his desire and takes no pleasure from the trough and wallowing in the mire. Read not this book in any case but with a single eye. Read not but first desire God's grace to understand thereby. Pray still in faith with this respect to bear good fruit therein, that knowledge may bring this effect to mortify your sin. Then happy you shall be in all your life what so to you befalls. Yes, doubly happy you shall be when God by death you calls. Folks, you can't live right and you can't die well without your Bible, where you will get to know your precious Lord Jesus Christ, where you will learn about your home that is being prepared for you right now. Amen. Amen. Would you stand, please? Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here, you've never received Christ as your Savior. That is the primary, number one need of your life. Receive him. Let us visit with you. Talk to you. Pray with you. Help you on your journey. If you're here and this series that I have begun is kind of stirring your spirit because you haven't been doing this or haven't been doing it right or enough. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. Hey, just right where you're standing. You can come forward and I'll be glad to pray with you. But standing where you are, just tell the Lord, He already knows. And make that meaningful commitment. By God's grace and help and the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you're going to be more serious about your Bible. <clears throat> and then if you're here and you're seeking a church home, this is where God says He wants you, and I want you to come forward and welcome. Whatever your need is, this is the place, this is the time. May God richly lead you and bless you. Our Father, bless this invitation. Have your will and way in every heart and mind and life. May your will be done. May your name be glorified. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. We're going to sing number number 249. Number 249. <laughs>